Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're very excited to have Nikos Afanasiou, who's gonna tell us about scale critical trap surface formation criterion for the Einstein-Maxwell system. So take it away, Nikos. Indeed, I would first like to thank from the bottom of my heart, the organizers for their kind invitation. And I just wanna stress what a big uh, honor and the privilege it is for me to meet uh, with you online and to talk at uh, this colloquium. So as Dan said, uh, my talk will uh, be on a scale critical trap surface formation criterion for the Einstein-Maxwell uh, system. So Einstein equations coupled to the electromagnetic tensor. Okay. So this will be an outline of my talk, uh, even though I'm very uh, fully aware that I'm speaking to a group of experts. I hope you excuse a few slides of introduction just to bring everything into context and uh, harmonize everything as best I can. Then I will uh, spend a few slides talking about the setup of the problem, of the evolution problem. And then I will talk about uh, the actual existence of the space time. And given the global existence of the space time, I will uh, focus on uh, the actual formation result itself, which, as we will see, is a, more or less an OD argument once the semi global existence has been established. This is uh, much easier to do than, than step number three. And finally, I will talk about related and future work and uh, hopes and ideas to, to follow. So our story begins on November the 25th, when, uh, 1915, when Albert Einstein presents his field equations of general relativity to the Prussian Academy of Sciences. And as we all know very well, space-time is a four-dimensional manifold equipped with the Lorentzian metric G, satisfying the Einstein field equations, uh, as seen here. Where R mu is the rich curvature tensor, R is the scalar curvature, and T mu denotes the stress energy momentum tensor of the matter fluid under study. Um, can everybody hear me clearly? Let me just ask. Perfect. So naturally, um, he was proposing that uh, gravity is somehow a geometric effect, and his theory was revolutionary, as we, you all know. And as it turns out, in the early years, uh, research seemed to follow two broad directions. The first one was work towards experimental verification of the theory. So make sure that Einstein, that the theory Einstein suggests, actually um, agrees with experiments done outside, okay? And hence is worthy of further investigation. And the second one, in complete absence of an initial value problem, mind you, in the early years, was uh, work towards identifying explicit solutions uh, to the Einstein equations. And in fact, in the, for the vacuum equations. Even. So, of course, we're going to be focusing more on the second aspect of things in this talk. Um, it didn't take long for the first non-trivial solution, uh, non-Minkowski, if you want, solution to the vacuum equations to show up. It was given by Carl Schwartz in a letter to Einstein perhaps a month after the publication of uh, his theory of general relativity, in which, uh, in, in which was contained um, the Schwarzschild the Schwartz space-time and the Schwarzschild metric. Um, so funnily enough, in the form that in the standard coordinates, if you want, um, it was not uh, obvious to the scientists what was exactly happening with, with Schwarzschild space-time. And it was first realized by Lemaitre in 1932 that Schwarzschild contains um, a non-empty region B with the following features. Number one, any observer that sits inside this region B cannot send a signal to an ideal conformal boundary at infinity denoted by I plus, and here we think of future non-infinity. And moreover, every time like or now geodesic gamma that enters the interior of this region B is future incomplete. So these are really uh, impressive characteristics about, about the Schwarzschild solution. And because uh, it took scientists perhaps by surprise, the first reaction was to consider them as, a, as an accident, as a, as a pathology present only due to the high degree of symmetry present already in the Schwarzschild solution, and that in generic situations, whatever that would mean, such phenomena would not arise. Okay. So the hopes of uh, 
this community were spectacularly falsified by the celebrated incompleteness theorem of Penrose, Roger Penrose in the 1960s. So Penrose introduces the notion of a, of a trapped surface. Okay. And given a general four-dimensional time-oriented Lorentzian manifold N, G, and the closed uh, space-like two surface S, we can define the two second fundamental forms, chi and uh, chi hat, which correspond to viewing S as a hypersurface in each of the two connected components of the boundary of the causal future of S. Okay, so here and here. And we say that S is trapped if and only if both its future expansions are pointwise negative. Okay, so trace chi needs to be uh, negative, and so does trace chi bar. Uh, intuitively, this means that the area of S, of S tends to decrease along uh, infinitesimal displacements along the null generators of these two uh, surfaces, hypersurfaces. The theorem, uh, as we know, says that if M comment is a global hyperbolic space time with a non compact Cauchy hypersurface, and if M satisfies some very, very mild physical assumptions, namely that R of V, V is greater or equal to zero for all null vectors V, for example, the vacuum equation satisfies that, many other uh, matter models satisfy that. And if M contains a closed trapped surface, then M is future causally geodesically incomplete. The way Penrose falsifies the arguments of um, the aforementioned community is by Cauchy stability in some sense, right? The existence of a trapped surface is stable in the context of dynamics, meaning a perturbation of Schwarzschild data would still give rise to trapped surfaces. And hence, uh, hence, you know, it is not an accident what we see with, with Schwarzschild. And it is for this reason, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and the main reason, for which uh, Roger Penrose was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2020 in physics. But as often happens, uh, you know, it's sort of like a Lernea Hydra, as we say in Greek, meaning that you cut one head and then 10, 10 come up. So as uh, wonderful and satisfying as Penrose's completeness theorem was, it gave rise to even further questions. Okay? Um, one of the most important of which was um, whether trapped surfaces are, are dynamical objects in any, in any sense. Uh, the existence of a trapped surface was too strong of an assumption. And in particular in the early 60s, perhaps the only way to guarantee the existence of a trapped surface was to uh, assume its existence already in the initial data. Uh, of course, this itself is uh, also another problem, a uh, very important problem. The first existence result uh, is due to uh, Rick Shane and uh, Sing Tun Yao, um, who give conditions on an initial data set uh, on how this initial data set can contain a trapped surface. But a very natural question as well is whether trapped surfaces can form in evolution starting from untrapped initial data. And let me just mention that this is a question of profound physicality. Since for example, if black holes are to agree with the astronomical objects that now have been observed uh, with uh, the famous uh, pictures and telescopes, okay, then they better form from a time when they do not exist. So that's, that's what's happening here. The history of this question is rich and ongoing. First, it was given to Dimitri Khrushchev-Lulu as part of his PhD thesis, but of course, he was not able to solve the entire problem in the absence of symmetry. Instead, he worked on a series of papers by Khrushchev-Lulu for, for the gravitational collapse of a scalar field. So he gave conditions on the initial data to form trapped surfaces. He gave initial data that also can give rise to naked singularities. And then he managed to prove, so he gave a complete picture of gravitational collapse. He managed to prove that these uh, naked singularities are non-generic. But all these results took place in, in spherical symmetry. In the absence of symmetry, where, for example, the vacuum equations become very interesting, uh, there was a breakthrough by Dimitri Kustodoulou in the absence of symmetry for the vacuum equations using what was termed the delta short pulse method. 
So in the absence of symmetry, one of the most difficult things to do is first of all, you have to reconcile with the fact that um, the stability of Minkowski theorem says that if you're gonna see any pathologies, you're gonna have to have large data in some sense. But you need to balance this with the fact that if your data are too large or large in an uncontrollable way, then you will not be able to prove a, an existence result for time long enough to, for trap surfaces to even have a chance to form. So um, what Christodoulou did was uh, he sort of assigned delta weights, smallness weights, uh, appropriately to its quantity involved. And he managed to show that this hierarchy that he built, this delta hierarchy that he built, is preserved in, uh, in evolution. Okay. Uh, thus, uh, obtaining the first uh, trapped surface formation result in the absence of symmetry, that's in 2008. One year later, uh, the work of Kleiner Manognansky on trapped surface formation extends Christodoulou's results using a different uh, scaling. Uh, one of the most important things that happened in this paper was that the 600 page paper, 700 page paper was reduced to 120 page paper. And uh, the number of derivatives of curvature needed to close the argument were re re cut down, cut down to just one derivative of curvature. Um, using Kleinerman Rodiansky's scaling, uh, Pin Yu worked on Einstein Maxwell and produced the corresponding result for a trapped surface formation criterion for Einstein Maxwell using uh, the data of Kleinerman Rodiansky appropriately modified to include uh, electromagnetism for a finite problem. For, for a finite problem. Okay. Um, importantly, there's the work of Van Luke on a scale critical trapped surface formation criterion in a finite region as well. And by scale critical, here what Van Luke asked is what is the smallest, in a sense, size of initial data that one can have in order to form a trapped surface? For example, for Christodoulou's data, um, the induced metric on the spheres uh, had. Uh, uh, was, was large, for example, in H1. And here, uh, you're only allowed to be large in H, you can on, afford to be large only in H3 halves with, with Unlook. So it's a different thing. Um, building on Unlook, uh, there's the work of Van that gives initial data that gives rise to an apparent horizon. So that's, that's a complete, a complete hypersurface, if you want, of uh, spheres for which the trace uh, chi is pointwise zero. And finally, I want to mention the work of Xin Yang An on a scale critical uh, formation criterion for the vacuum equations, where he gives a different scaling. I will explain what, what An does. And uh, our paper uh, borrows very much from the ideas uh, developed in this, in this paper and extends the ideas developed in this, in this later paper. Okay. So let us uh, proceed to talk about the framework itself that we use to set up the problem. Okay. So the space time that we're going to construct in the present work is covered by a double null foliation. So we use the double null gauge given by three-dimensional incoming null hypersurfaces. So here you see H u infinity, where u equals u infinity. Uh, and here you have an arbitrary u, for example. So, so anything that cuts horizontally is an h u. And here, h bar zero is where u bar equals zero. And the space-time region that we're going to build will extend all the way up to u bar equals one. Now, again, this mimics the approach of an 2019. Uh, what usually happens up to then was you sort of focused here from u bar equals zero to u bar equals delta, the size delta region. And that's where the smallness um, of its term that would crucially appear in the nonlinear terms to close the bootstrap arguments came from. Here, we will find another way to, you know, we will, we will gain our smallness from a different place in some sense. But nevertheless, when we talk about the setup, the setup is a three-dimensional income canal hypersurfaces h bar u bar cutting like this, outgoing null hypersurface is cutting like that, and of course the pairwise intersection uh, two spheres s u u bar. And throughout uh, we shall be working with normalized uh, 
vectors d3 and d4 such that t of d3 4 equals minus 2. And the metric will take the following form that we see here. So our main results are the following. They can be broken down into three, three statements, three theorems. So the first one goes as follows. The first one has to do with the semi-global existence itself. So given some number i, initial i, there exists a sufficiently large a0 such that the following holds. For any a that is greater than a0, and for smooth initial data, mind you're working on the characteristic initial value problem, so the only free data we have on the einstein maxwell system is the shear chi hat, and alpha f, which is a component of the uh, Maxwell tensor, which we're going to uh, define explicitly in a couple of slides. But this is the amount of free data you have in this problem. So if you satisfy here the following answers along u equals u infinity, and you have Minkowski initial data on the initial incoming cone, Then the Einstein Maxwell equations admit a unique smooth solution in the region where u bar is between zero and one inclusive, and u is between u infinity and minus a over four inclusive. So here would be u equals minus a over four. And let me talk a little bit about the answers itself. Where does the largeness here uh, come from? The largeness comes from the largeness of a, right? So if I take this A and, of course, bring it to the right-hand side, what we see is that A to the half is what brings the largeness. In uh, similar results obtained by Dimitri Christodoulou and Kleiner Marindansky, et cetera, you would see things here like delta to the sum power times the initial data is bounded by a constant. And the smallness of delta would be what would give you the appropriate room, the appropriate largeness. So here, this is this is a slightly different, uh, slightly different approach, right? The second one now, given semi-global existence, with the addition of this uh, initial, uh, this this initial condition, which is that the integral of a weighted uh, chi hat zero squared plus the initial a f squared integrated over u bar is greater or equal than the number a uniformly for every direction along u equals u, u infinity. So if we assume that, then we can conclude that the space-time forms or contains a trapped surface right here in the corner. So in, <coughs> sorry, a minus, minus a over 4, comma 1. Uh, let me note that this is a an isotropic criterion, what you see here, in the sense that we, de we, we demand that this sort of integral be large along every possible direction along u equals u infinity. Uh, there is also an anisotropic criterion uh, which uh, has been obtained by Kleiner Marodinansky in collaboration with Jonathan Luke, in which case you can only allow largeness in this integral along just one uh, one direction, if you like. Uh, of course, this is something that we could probably do, but we did not delve into. Okay, but this is something that definitely can be done, and anisotropic criterion can be obtained. And finally, uh, we we perform a rescaling of theorem three, and uh, we obtain uh, estimates that have to uh, do with estimates in a delta region. So, by an appropriate rescaling of coordinates, we bring the region of size one into a region of size delta. And as such, we are able to compare uh, estimates, uh, for example, from unlook. Okay? And we recover estimates from unlook. We recover the estimates from unlook. So hence the scale critical uh, condition. So with regards to the Einstein equations in a double null foliation, this is the system we work with. Here, the stress energy momentum tensor has the following form for F alpha beta uh, representing the electromagnetic field. Okay, So what we do is we introduce null uh, tetrads E, A, E, B, E3, E4, where A comma B equals 1 and 2. 
and require that g of e a comma e b is delta alpha b, uh, g three e four equals minus two, and uh, everything else is zero. With regards to building the Bianchi equations, we work with the value curvature components, uh, alpha, alpha bar, vita, vita bar, rho, and sigma. And in the same frame, we have the Ricci coefficients um, chi a alpha beta equals g of d alpha e4 a beta, chi uh, hat chi, chi bar a b equals something similar. And of course, we have eta, eta bar, omega, omega bar, and the torsion one form zeta. Finally, this, this tackles the, the, the purely geometric part, if you want. For the actual Maxwell tension, we decompose it into the following components. So alpha f, which is part of the initial data, is the following, is defined as follows. Alpha bar f is defined uh, in the same way for the, for the corresponding thing. And uh, rho f is defined as half f34, and sigma f is defined as f12. So given that, <clears throat> the Einstein equations in a double null relation reduced to a collection of null structure equations, which we see here, written down, those, plus the uh, Bianchi equations, the null Bianchi equations expressed, expressed in this frame. So one thing I want to say from the get-go is that you see here, for example, instead of writing beta, I write beta tilde. And instead of writing uh, beta bar, I write beta bar tilde. This is something that was not present in the case of the vacuum. And it's actually something we used to, it's a renormalization that we introduced in order to tackle the Maxwell, the Maxwell part. So uh, the Maxwell equations themselves are equivalent to the following null Maxwell equations, following six equations, if you want. And the important thing to mention here is that what is very good about Maxwell in double null gates is that the corresponding null Maxwell equations closely resemble in form the Bianchi equations. And hence energy estimates for the Maxwell components will be carried out in much the same way as the energy estimates for uh, curvature components, as we will see uh, later on in the slide. So, very briefly, what are the difficulties, main difficulties present, and how we overcome them? So, we can already see from the setup of the problem that here we have matter, so we have uh, an inhomogeneous part, right? So, the Bianchi equations contain a collection of terms that do not present themselves in vacuum. And these terms cannot always be estimated crucially through the null Maxwell equations. For example, if one looks at the null Bianchi equation for the wild curvature component Vita, we will see that we have nabla for Vita plus two trace chi Vita equals div uh, alpha, everything okay. The inhomogeneous part, the, the matter part, comes here. This, of course, in vacuum is, is zero, does not exist, doesn't show up. If you pay close attention to the term D4 R4 A alpha, this contains the term rho f comma sigma f times nabla four of alpha f. And if you go back, of course, here, you will see that there is no um, Maxwell equation for uh, nabla four alpha f. So, of course, there are other ways to overcome this issue, but what was chosen to be done in the end, what was done in the paper, is that we overcome this issue by introducing the renormalized components, beta tilde equals Vita minus a half R for A. And we bring this to the other side. And everything that is left now on the, on the right hand side has terms that are either directly estimated or can be estimated through the null Maxwell equations. So everything, as you can see here, is rewritten in terms of uh, alpha alpha bar, vita tilde, vita bar tilde, rho and sigma. Now, I will also explain what this, this, these terms are here, okay? So any uh, psi here is anything involving uh, vita, rho sigma, vita bar, and alpha bar. 
any component here that you see mathcal y, any component y that you see here is any uh, Maxwell component that does not equal alpha f. So rho f, sigma f, and alpha bar f. And what I give here is a schematic depiction of the null Bianchi equations expressed in the, in the double null case. And what is also important is that the Maxwell equations need to be handled at one level of differentiability higher than the curvature components. Okay, and this, for example, we can see here from 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 nabla four beta tilde plus two trace chi beta tilde blah 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 equals something that involves nabla on five. So, if for example I want to close at ten derivatives of curvature, let's say I would need estimates on uh, eleven derivatives of the Maxwell components. So this is something we need to keep in mind, and this is one of the this is the main reason why we need to introduce elliptic estimates in our uh, treating of the the problem. What is the most important um, aspect here is the way that we're gonna build our norms and how we're gonna build uh, these norms. We're gonna keep in mind that we're trying to preserve the size of the norm upon evolution for the different uh, components involved, for the ridge coefficients, for the curvature components, and for the normal components. So given a tensor field here, phi, that is any curvature component, here I should include uh, tilde beta and tilde beta bar. Right? Any uh, ridge coefficient and any non natural components. Uh, we use something that I introduced in his thesis back in 2012, which is uh, the signature for decay rates. and was also crucially used in his 2019 paper. So I award uh, phi, with the following. <clears throat> I apologize for my neck. I have been teaching for three hours and had a, had a brief 20 minute uh, gap. Uh, so S2 of phi equals zero times the number N4 of phi, where here N4 means the number of times E4 appears in the definition of said uh, tensor field. I give a half, a half, half a point every time that uh, an angular, if you want, uh, vector appears, EA or EB. I give one every time uh, E3 comes in the picture, in the definition, and then I subtract one. So given this S2 of phi, NJ of phi, of course, is the number of times EJ appears in the definition of phi, we define the following scale invariant uh, norms. Okay, so for L infinity scale, uh, I go A to the minus S2 of phi times mod U to the 2S2 phi plus one times the regular L infinity norm. And I build downwards to L2 norms and L1 norms, depending on what one would expect. So here I have A to the minus S2 phi, U to the 2S2 phi, uh, phi in L2, A to the minus S2 phi, u to the 2 s to phi minus 1, phi in L1. And then I build uh, exactly what I would expect for norms along the null hypersurfaces, H u and H bar u bar. So this is the sort of norms that we're going to be dealing with. But before I say anything about how I build these norms, which will be here, I want to say how these norms are useful and why they are important. <clears throat> First of all, there's a conservation and balance of signatures along every equation that you can see, meaning transport, constraint, Bianchi, and Maxwell. Uh, this comes, you know, essentially S2 of phi1 times phi dotted with phi2 equals S2 phi1 plus S2 phi2. Uh, so I can, because I can assign signatures in a consistent way, I can assign scale invariant norms in a consistent way as well. And the point is the following, that because the einstein maxwell system is a coupled system that involves a lot of quantities, that signature for decay rates allows one to give norms such that in the evolution of this large, let's say, initial data, most of these quantities are bounded by one in the set norms upon evolution, with the exception, of course, of a few anomalous terms that are tackled in the original definition of the total norms we will bootstrap. Crucially, 
Um, well, crucially, uh, the holder inequality expressed in scale invariant norms allows for a smallness factor to appear. Okay, so by definition of the scale invariant norms, what this what this achieve is that when, for example, I have a nonlinear term and I want to estimate it in L two, I can estimate this by one over u bar times uh, phi one in L infinity times phi two in L two. And for uh, the product of two terms in L1, I can bound this by 1 over u bar times f1 in L2, f2 in L2. The point is that because u is large, u bar, 1 over u bar is small. And this is where the smallness comes from. This is a direct analogy to how Klein and Marodinansky say build their delta scale norms, where phi 1 times phi 2 is less or equal than delta to the half times phi 1 a infinity phi 2 in L2. What we gain from this is, 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 is huge in the sense that it's essentially saying that nonlinear terms are, uh, are, are somehow negligible, are, are small upon, upon estimation. Okay. And this gain in smallness is crucial to closing all the bootstrap arguments that we're going to need for, for semi global existence. The proof of semi-global existence rests on the following sequence of estimates. So we have a norm here, omega. We have a norm R, which corresponds to the, the curvature norm along the null hypersurfaces. And we have a F, which corresponds to the energy norm along uh, of the Maxwell components along null hypersurfaces. Now, what these are for the Ricci and partially curvature, but always an L2 norm, this, this omega norm, I define, for example, anything that is that is regular, for example, omega, trace chi, e data bar, omega. In terms of scaling, I don't need anything else to put here in the bootstrap norm. There are, however, some anomalous uh, quantities, for example, chi hat, chi bar hat, trace chi, and, uh, and tilde trace chi, which needs to, to be you know, multiplied, weighted by something else. So here, if you want, um, since I'm putting all i infinity equals one over a to the half scale infinity normal value u bar, what essentially we're going to be saying is that this chi hat sort of behaves like a to the half as u is large. Okay, or this, for example, trace chi in this scaled norm, right, is going to behave like u squared over a somehow so this is this is what we use to build to build our norms then we build the corresponding things uh, for the for the curvature and for the null maxwell components similar uh, norms in l2 and then we build the the energy norms along the hypersurfaces null hypersurfaces and of course we also use a, an elliptic top order norm Okay, which involves the Ricci coefficients, but works on top order, which is going to come useful when we run the energy estimates on the maximum components, which are also closed in 11 derivatives of curvature. <coughs> so, the proof of semi global existence rests on the following sequence of estimates. First, using the bootstrap assumptions that we put, we say that the uh, you know, O, o norm is bounded by one plus the curvature norm plus the earth norm. Then we do the same thing for the elliptic norm, the top order norm. And then finally, we close energy estimates for the macro components at 11 derivatives and energy estimates for the curvature R in 10 derivatives. And based on those estimates, it's a priori estimates if you want, uh, a standard procedure can be invoked to provide the proof of the semi global existence of, of the space time up to say u equals minus a over four. Now, new ingredients compared to the vacuum case were needed in our proof. Uh, perhaps the, the most straightforward one was to extend the definition of the signature for decay rates to the null maxwell components. Indeed, this can be done in a smooth way and preserves the structure you would expect to see. Um, to introduce the renormalized quantities, beta bar and uh, beta, sorry, beta tilde and beta bar tilde, to replace the standard beta beta bar and to close estimates with them. And uh, thirdly, the need to incorporate and prove appropriate elliptic estimates in the scale invariant norms. 
So let's let's begin with that. So initial estimates on the metrics of volume embedding and commutation formula. We begin by imposing uh, bootstrap assumptions. Let's say that O is bounded by a constant, R is bounded by R, and phi is bounded by phi is bounded by F is bounded by F. Um, so once you have these bootstrap assumptions here, um, the first thing you do is you obtain improvements on the metric components. Using improvements on the metric components, you can uh, obtain the transport equation inequalities that you're going to need. So here, phi in L2 scale is less than phi originally, plus the integral from zero to u bar, nabla for phi. And phi in L2 is also less or equal than phi initially, plus the integral from u infinity to whatever you are, a over u prime squared, nabla three phi in L2 scale. But as it turns out, uh, for equations along the incoming direction, sometimes the borderline terms, you know, these nabla three uh, terms, require a bit more care. And uh, as we will see here, this is the sort of estimate that, that we need to use. So for example, if I have, uh, you know, SU, U bar tangent tensor fits of run K satisfying the following transport equation. So, nabla three V plus lambda zero trace sky bar V equals Y. If we define lambda one equals two L zero minus one, lambda zero minus one, we have this weighted estimate. And this often uh, improves what we can achieve because otherwise trace sky, trace sky bar is, is very, very bad. And you would lose information if you just simply plot it on the right hand side. You can do something better in these cases. And you're gonna have to to do so. Uh, using all of that and some bounds on the isoperimetric constant and uh, some, some, some uh, routine, routine things by now in these sort of papers, we can obtain the Sobolev embedding statement. So scale infinity norm of phi is bounded by the sum of the first two derivatives of a to the half nabla to the i phi in L2 uh, scale. And of course, this is going to come up very, very often. Now, if we're going to be closing um, estimates for, let's say, 10 derivatives of Ritz coefficients, 10 derivatives of Kerbal circle points, et cetera, we, of course, need the corresponding uh, transport equations for those, or Bianchi equations for those. And this is what we obtain through the, the repeated commutation formula, if you want. So if you suppose that nabla 4 phi is some some, some expression f0. And if I let nabla 4, nabla i phi to be fi, then fi takes the following form. <clears throat> well, I need to explain here what we're seeing, okay? What we're seeing is any psi is a good, uh, good Ritz coefficient. And psi is going to be either eta or eta bar. Now, what this nabla i to the one psi uh, to the i2 means is that um, there are I2 uh, Ritzy terms, and that the sum of derivatives falling on all these Ritzy terms is I1. And then you have nabla 3, I3, F0, and you have this expression. Similarly, if nabla 3 phi is G0 and nabla 3 nabla I phi is GI, then GI plus I over 2 trace chi bar nabla I phi equals this set expression here that you need to, to tackle. And of course, when you're going to be estimating things like this, this is where this sort of equation comes into play, this sort of, this sort of lemma. So uh, once we have achieved the preliminary estimates, we go and obtain estimates on the Ritz coefficients, as I said, here in terms of curvature and the Maxwell norm. So I will give one example from each class. Let's say that the sum uh, zero J 10 of these guys here, meaning the total norm, the total Omicron norm that I have defined is less or equal than one plus R plus F. And an example of this is the following. Okay, so under the bootstrap assumptions, we have for up to 10 derivatives, one over A to the half, the scale two norm of A to the half nabla to the I chi hat is bounded uh, 
Okay, this means uh, bounded by a constant that doesn't depend. Yeah. Okay. So bounded by R, the, the, the energy norm of A plus one. And the proof goes as follows. It, it is always the same, the similar spirit, okay? So we begin with the, the structure equation here for the Ritz coefficient, which is number for chi hat. Schematically is a good Ritz coefficient times chi hat plus A alpha. Commuting with I angular derivatives using this proposition, we obtain everything up to, you know, this holds for general I, but we will focus, of course, just on, on up to 10 derivatives. And then here, what we do using the transport equations that we obtained, you can say that one over a to the half, uh, a to the half nabla to the i uh, chi hat in the scale two non is bounded as follows. Okay, so here, what is important is first of all that this guy is what gives you this first term is what gives you the r alpha norm. And then everything you see here can actually be bounded by one using the bootstrap assumptions and some helpful uh, lemma. So this is how one would obtain uh, this, this given statement. So use bootstrap assumptions on the commuted equation. With regards to elliptic estimates, um, for top order derivatives of the Ritz coefficients. We're gonna use a, a very important proposition, which is um, ha, ha, has to do with diff curl systems. So if F is a R plus one covariant, totally symmetric tensor field on a metric two sphere that satisfies, this is my divergence, this is my curl, this is my trace. Then up to 11 derivatives, which is what we care about, we have that the scale two uh, norm of this guy is bounded by a to the half times the corresponding scale uh, two norms of the divergence and the curl, but summed all the way up to i minus one. And then something which is completely estimable, something which is uh, not going to give you any trouble. And using this, we are able to show that the uh, you know, uh, elliptic norm is bounded by one plus r plus f. So as an example, I'm going to show that a to the fifth nabla to the 11th omega in the uh, scale two norm along the outgoing null hypersurface is bounded by the corresponding energy norm of uh, beta tilde plus one. So here again, I, uh, I believe that these ideas, these ideas can be traced back to, uh, to the 90s, okay? To, to Kleinerman and Rodian's, uh, to, to Christodoulou Kleinerman's uh, stability of Minkowski proof. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but for example, here, the idea would be something like this. The problem always is that, uh, for example, when I, when I include beta, I have nabla of beta tilde equals, again, some nabla of curvature plus some, some other terms. So here I build some quantities, for example, this kappa, if you want, works like a Hobbes D1 of mega minus a half beta uh, tilde. So if you want here, you can see that after, after appropriate calculations, you can see that number three Hobbes D1 of omega equals a half uh, nabla rho plus a half Hodge nabla sigma plus other terms. And then I have here nabla three uh, beta tilde plus trace chi bar beta tilde equals nabla rho plus Hodge nabla sigma plus lower order uh, terms. So you can see here that if you form Hodge d1 of omega minus a half beta tilde, these sort of guys cancel, cancel out. <coughs> and hence, crucially, you obtain a transport equation for, K, for kappa that does not involve nabla curvature. Anyway, 
it might involve Nabla uh, Maxwell, but not Nabla Kirchhoff. And uh, using this, we can obtain adequate control up to 10 derivatives of kappa. And then using a, a diff curl system, we can bound a to the five nabla to the 11 omega uh, in L2 by the corresponding estimate for kappa up to 10 derivatives now, plus the corresponding estimate for, for vita, vita tilde, plus some terms that are immediately bounded by one. And of course, this is what gives the R uh, vita tilde norm, tilde vita norm. And this is sort of the idea. So, so similar cancellations happen for, for different uh, aspects of the elliptic, uh, the elliptic estimates. You, you build appropriate quantities like the mass aspect function, mu, et cetera. And finally, for energy estimates, uh, the way we close uh, energy estimates with uh, Silian in this paper is uh, through the introduction of, of Bianchi pairs. So what I mean by Bianchi pairs here is that if you let a general Y1 and a general Y2 to be either pairs of uh, involving um, curvature or pairs involving the Maxwell components. In any case, you can notice that this sort of pairs have the following schematic form. If you write nabla 3y1 plus a half plus s2y1 trace sky bar y1 minus some operator, Hodge operator d uh, y2, that's some, some, some expression. And then nabla 4y2 minus uh, Hodge d, uh, Hodge star d y1 equals some other expression. And um, here, if you commute the above equations, you arrive at the corresponding commuted thing, right? But what you can obtain, crucially, is the following proposition. If nabla 3, nabla i, y1, plus i plus 1 over 2 plus s2, y1, trace sky bar, nabla i, y1, minus this equals pi, and this equals qi, then this is how the energy estimates work. The norm along the outgoing null hypersurface of nabla to the i y1 plus a over u squared nabla to the i uh, y2 is bounded by the corresponding values of the initial data, corresponding initial values of these norms, plus some space time integrals, okay, nabla to the i y1 times pi plus nabla, the corresponding space time integral for nabla to the i y2 times qi in L1 scaled norm. And the point is that by the time we have obtained all the elliptic estimates and all the uh, preceding estimates, all the Ritzy estimates, et cetera, we are in a position to uh, control the space-time integrals uh, completely. And hence obtain, obtain the results that we want. And crucially, as we note here, the important thing is that the structure of the Maxwell equations is used crucially. So expressed in a double null gate, the null Maxwell equations resemble the Bianchi equations in the sense that they can be made to work as in Bianchi pairs. So we use the same sort of energy proposition. This is a fundamental energy proposition, both to control the Bianchi uh, equations and to control the null Maxwell equations. Now, once this is done, uh, as I said, an a priori argument concludes the proof of semi-global existence once you have the energy estimates. And now uh, let's proceed to the actual formation part. I don't know how I'm doing for time. You good, you've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, 10 minutes left, perfect. So uh, the proof of existence now, along with the estimates that we have obtained in the process, allows us to understand what happens to appropriate weights of alpha f squared and appropriate weights of uh, chi hat squared as you sort of go in this direction, as, as you go up, right? Remember, everything here is Minkowski. So using the estimates that I have obtained, I can bound u squared omega squared times alpha f squared is greater or equal than its initial value 
minus a to the seven fourth over uh, u. And similarly, that holds u squared omega squared chi hat squared is greater or equal than its initial value minus a to the seven fourths over u. And now, if you put, if you take these two guys and pick u equals minus a over four, and you use the fact that omega, the, the lapse function is very close to its initial value. And you also use the fact that um, the integral of these guys, remember, uh, let me take you back to this assumption. This is where we need this assumption, right? That the integral of u infinity squared chi zero hat squared, blah, blah, blah. This is where it comes up. This is not something that is needed in the semi-global existence proof at all. We obtain the following, that the integral from zero to one when u is minus a over four of chi hat squared plus alpha f squared is greater or equal than 12 over alpha. And hence, uh, we know what happens upstairs now. We know what happens here. We know what happens in the integral here. So to finish the proof, we consider the, the Rachel Dury in some sense equation, the, the structure equation for trace chi. And we obtain that omega inverse trace chi at minus a4, comma one, comma theta one, theta two, is less than or equal than the corresponding thing at minus a, alpha, a over four, zero, theta one, theta two, minus the integral that we built. So just to emphasize uh, this guy here is Minkowski, okay? So it should be like two over u. So it should be eight over alpha, two over a over four. And uh, by this estimate and our assumption, we see that the trace chi uh, is point, the trace chi is pointwise negative on the sphere S minus a over four comma one. And of course, uh, it's much easier to see that trace sky bar should be uh, very close to minus two over u in L infinity point wise. And in particular, uh, trace sky bar is uh, easily seen to be negative for all uh, points on the two surface. And since we have obtained point wise negativity on trace sky and trace sky bar, we conclude that the surface is trapped. And um, finally, the rescaling um, using the following coordinate system. Okay, so I rescale everything by delta. I translate the picture from a zero one uh, region to a zero delta region and obtain the estimates of, of Van Broek. And let me discuss before, before finishing a couple of uh, important uh, questions. So with regards to related work, um, an interesting question was, apart from finding trapped surfaces, one should uh, endeavor to find uh, untrapped initial data, which give rise to a hypersurface that really tells you you are trapped from there on. Okay? So I'm talking about, of course, about an apparent horizon. So what we were able to obtain in collaboration with Martin Lazurt, who is uh, in the audience and at Harvard, uh, is construction of Cauchy initial data that give rise to apparent horizons. And we also managed to obtain a provision of the first, to our humble knowledge, a full dynamical test of the space-time Penrose inequality and verification of the inequality in an open region in the future of the initial data. The size of the region itself controllable by the parameters of the initial data as, uh, as, we, as we input them. And with regards to the future of, of this work, many things perhaps can be said, but uh, an extension of the trapped surface formation results to different matter models would be of great interest to the community. Um, and it is fair to claim that the most difficult problem should be the study of trapped surface formation for the Einstein Euler system. There, of course, you would have issues of regularity. So you'd have to give initial data that somehow make sure that shocks do not form before trapped surfaces have a chance to form. Okay. 
and um, I think there is a there is a, it can be claimed there is a consensus that the most difficult case would be the Einstein order system. But there are many other interesting mother models that can be can be tackled. And uh, for example, the Klein-Gordon tensor, mass massive scalar field tensor, and uh, many other many others. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, open to any questions. Thank you. Okay, so that's all thank Nikos for a great talk. And we have plenty of time for questions. So just unmute yourself and go ahead. I actually have two questions. Um, when, when you send Delta to um, zero, you're just uh, tightening the pulse the gravitational yes. pulse going into the yeah. system. Um, if you actually take delta all the way to zero, do you get a singularity along that entire rectangular region? And what kind of singularity might it be? So I'm not completely sure, but what I can remember is that there is a paper of Luke and Rodjansky, which takes the delta goes to zero limit and obtains solutions to the null dust model. Oh, nice, okay. Uh, sadly, I cannot say more, but I can say that this problem to my recollection has been addressed by Luke Rodinansky rather recently. And I think that they compared so limits of said solutions to uh, solutions uh, to the Einstein null dust system. Uh, okay, great. And the you. second question is, um, you're sending in like a gravitational pulse, but your initial data as far as the electromagnetism is concerned is not large in any way, right? Oh, it can be as large or as big as the geometric part itself. And uh, the only condition I have, anything, anything, thank you for the question. It's a very nice question. Uh, anything I, I, I impose on chi hat, the same thing can be imposed on alpha f. So in some sense, if you want, I can close chi hat zero completely, get a spherically symmetric space time, and just have electromagnetic radiation inputting the giving the trap surface formation. Oh, so you could cause the, um, you can cause the trap surface with ele electromagnetism alone. Exactly. Very exactly. nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I see the alpha F squared term, yeah, in the second theorem. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, essentially, this is what, what you care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. neat. Thank you. All right, do we have any more questions? If not, let's thank Nikos again, and I'll stop the recording and then we'll leave the room open if anybody wants to have informal discussion. Thank you.